Isn't it wonderful to feel the presence of the Lord and be with each other? And uh, Mary Jo, I thank you for that beautiful prayer you prayed for our president and the First Lady and his family to, to begin our service. Thank you for that. God bless you. I appreciate you um, just pouring your heart out and representing us. And so continue to pray for the First Family and that God will bless them. Praise God. Praise God. We've been talking uh, the last few weeks about some hard things Jesus wants us to do. We began with, you can do anything God wants you to do. Some of you remember that message. It helped us understand Philippians 4.13, which we've heard all the time. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Well, that message about you can do anything God wants you to do helped us understand that what that means is that we can do everything he wants us to do. That's, that's the meaning of that scripture. And also, we had a reminder that you can wait on God's perfect timing. None of us really like to wait, but you can wait on God's perfect time, and you can do that through his strength. Next, God's word encouraged us that you can make peace with difficult people. Now, that's a hard thing. Can you say amen? amen? But we can do it through the strength of Jesus. Then the word of God reminded us that you can stand out in the crowd. You want to stand out in the crowd? You want to be different than the world? Be kind. Be forgiving. Be loving. That, that's, that's different nowadays. Seems to be out of fashion these days. But you can stand out of the crowd through the strength of Jesus. And last week our message was, you can win against worry. Anybody's ever worried, say amen. Amen. You can win against worry through the strength of Jesus Christ. We can only do all these things through allowing Jesus to be our strength. So we're continuing to talk about hard things. But first, but first, did you ever think... I wish the pastor would preach about this. That ever come in your mind? You think, you know, I wish the, pre the pastor would just <laughs> preach about this subject. So, well, Emma, sometimes little children wish the pastor would preach about things. And Chase, you might have some ideas about some things you would like the pastor to preach about. I don't know, but uh, here's some ideas that were given to one pastor. Some suggestions and comments from the children. Uh, Richard, he made the mistake of asking the children, why don't, in Sunday school, why don't they just write, you know, maybe something they think they'd like to hear the pastor say. So, Chase, you may have some ideas. You can give them to your daddy sometime, and maybe they'd sound kind of like this. One little boy, Arnold, he's eight years old, lives in Nashville. He said, dear pastor, I know God loves everybody, but he never met my sister. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Arnold, eight years old. Here's another one. Please say in your sermon that Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson, nine-year-old. And here's one from Patty. Patty says, I'm sorry I can't leave more money in the offering, but my father did not give me a raise in my allowance. Could you have a sermon about a raise in my allowance? Oh, boy. Hang on for this one, all you that have siblings. I would like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother won't be there. <laughs> oh my, Stephen. How about this one? Please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you. <laughs> Alexander. How about this one? Are there any devils on earth? I think there may be one in my class, says Carla, age 10. And this is probably, uh, this may be some of your favorites. Maybe not even children, but adults think this way. Ralph, age 11, said, Dear Pastor, I like your sermon on Sunday. Especially when it was finished. <laughs> now, I heard some people laugh. <laughs> you, know, you know, one of the things I noticed, Margaret, is after church, people seem so happy. And I like to think they got the word of God in there. They're just ready to go out and put this in operation. <laughs> Margaret said they want to go eat too Well, praise God well, well, we talk about some hard things And so sometimes it's a hard thing to uh, deliver the word of God But I believe God's going to help Can you believe that? So our scripture text this morning is going to come from Philippians chapter 2 I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version this morning And the sermon title is You Can Serve Look at your neighbor and say, You Can Serve You Can Serve Okay so we're going to hear the word of God, and before I pray, uh, preach, uh, Tony Ratcliffe, I wonder if you would stand, sir, and just pray that God will touch our hearts and, and uh, use me as I share this word, sir. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful this morning that we got to 
come to church this morning. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you for everything that you've done. I pray, God, that you touch each and every person that is here this morning. I pray that you touch Brother Les as he takes preaches this morning, that he has say something that we can take and use through the week that will help us, help him, for us to open our hearts and our souls and minds to take and receive whatever he has to take and give us. Lord, we, we are so thankful. I am so thankful, God, for being here. I thank you so much for everything that you've done. I pray, God, that you touch each and every one of the ones that are sick, that couldn't make it this morning, yes. that you touch their bodies. Heavenly Father, we have got so much to be grateful for. Hallelujah. We have got so, got so much. And I thank you so much every day for what you've done for me. I pray, God, that you touch Brother Liz again and touch each and every one of us that we can take and receive this as, as we go through the day. Thank you so much, Lord. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for praying for me. Uh, the Apostle Paul was writing a letter when he was in prison. He wrote a letter to the Church of God at Philippi. And so I'm going to be sharing uh, with you this morning from Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 and 2. Paul says this to the early church, and let it speak to your heart today. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Complete my joy, Paul says to the church, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. He goes on to say, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. What a word for people today. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But instead, here's what Paul says through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He speaks this to us today. Instead of doing that, instead of doing everything just to, just to serve ourselves or to show how great we are, he says, but in humility, now hear this, count others more significant than yourselves. How about that? Let's let that sink in. You want to serve? You can serve. You know how you can serve? Treat others more important than you are. You know, we live in a world where everybody's, everybody's, try, everybody's trying to get ahead. Uh, Glenn and I were somewhere with her mother yesterday in Greensboro, and there was um, Tisca Church Road, and there were two lanes, but one lane was blocked because there had been an accident. And, you know, if people would just be courteous, you know, everybody could get in. But not everybody's courteous. You ever seen anybody that's discourteous? Count others more significant than yourself. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. So you want to serve others? Think about how what you're saying and doing is going to affect other people. Think about the consequences, not just to you, but how is it going to affect other people. Now here's the key verse. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. In other words, think like him. Paul says in verse 6, who, speaking of Jesus... Though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but instead what he did, verse 7, but Jesus, he's speaking of Jesus, emptied himself by taking the form of a what? A servant. A servant being born in the likeness of men. Now we're talking about the everlasting word of God. Jesus, the son of God. Who has always been and will always be. But what he did is he took on the form of a servant. In verse 8. And being found in human form. Here's what he did. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him. And bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Can you say his name? Jesus. Jesus. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And may God add his blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word. Can you say amen? amen. So look at your neighbor again and say, you can serve. I want you to hear that. Why do preachers do that? I want that to get in your mind. You can serve. You can serve. <laughs> you can serve. 
Tony, show me the next slide. It's got some letters on it. I'm going to pick on one of our children. Chase, Chase, can you see this? Can you tell me those letters? You don't want to tell me? Oh, my goodness. Can you see them? Do you need glasses? Can you tell me the first one? A, B. B, A. You ever been to the eye doctor? Okay, Emma, I'm going to pick on you, darling. Can you read those letters, sweetheart? Okay, would you read them for me? I'm sorry. Say, say, it, say it like you're hungry. Oh, one more time. Give her a big cheer. <laughs> W-W-J-D. Now, some, some, uh, some of these young people that left even, they, they might not even know what that's about. But how many of you remember? Don't say it. Just raise your hand if you remember. Okay. Okay, give me the next slide there, Tony. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? There's an interesting story about that. A lot of you remember those bracelets, right? There was a young girl, she was a youth leader somewhere up in the north, and uh, she came up with this idea. And uh, so she made it for her youth group, and other youth groups heard about them, and they wanted them, and then everybody else wanted them, and everybody else wanted them. And she started, you know, ordering them, getting them made, and, you know, selling some of them. And uh, she finally decided, I think I can make money at this. Uh, but unfortunately, the company who was making, for, making them, they saw the potential. And so uh, they basically got the rights to do that, even though it was her design, because they got there first. And so they made a lot of money. She didn't make, she didn't make a lot of money, and she never did. But what happened is those things went all over the world. Anybody ever wear one? I used to wear one. What would Jesus do? Now, in this passage in Philippians chapter 2 that I just read, essentially, that's what Paul is asking. What would Jesus do? In other words, we need to have the attitude that Jesus had. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. Have the mind of Christ. Be about the business of Christ. Have the attitude of Christ. So here's the question. What was his attitude? Some of us used to wear those, and we'd look at it sometimes. I used to wear one. WWJD. What would Jesus do? Sometimes I... I'd face a, a challenge and I'd just say, what would Jesus do? Well, well, how do we know what Jesus would do? We have to think about what was his attitude. Well, let's, let's look at his attitude a little bit from Matthew chapter 20, reading from the King James Version, beginning at verse 25. <clears throat> Let me set the stage for this. In, in Matthew chapter 20, Jesus had just told his closest followers that I'm going to die. They're going to crucify me. They're going to take my life. He just told them that. Well, right after that, a couple of brothers that were in, the, in that group, they, they, they decided, they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest one. And so they said, you know, well, what about, what about us? You know, can we be the greatest? So everybody's arguing. He just said, I'm going to die. And, they, and they're thinking about who can take his place. <laughs> so this is what happened. I'll tell you the attitude of Jesus, Matthew 20, 25. But Jesus called them unto him. And he said, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. Listen to what he says in verse 26. This is Jesus. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Another word for that is let him be your servant. That's what a minister is. Minister is a servant. Because Jesus goes on, verse 27, Whosoever will be chief among you, let it be your servant. That's leadership, according to Jesus. Leaders serve. Leaders serve. That doesn't mean leaders don't have authority. But what do you do with that authority? You use the authority God's given you to serve others. I have authority. I was appointed pastor of this local church by the bishop of our state. So, so I have I have. I have some fiduciary responsibilities, which means, which means it's, it's, like, it's like a father. Someone else may neglect a child about to get hurt, but if a father neglects it, then you have violated your fiduciary responsibility. You, you have to be faithful to that, to that child because they belong to you. I have a fiduciary responsibility. I have a responsibility as, as a shepherd 
of, of this flock, so I have a certain amount of authority. But what do I do with that? What I should do with that is my actions, my attitudes, my words, my intentions, my designs, they should all be to help you and to serve you. Whoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. And then listen to verse 28. Even as the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, here's four words for you. What was his attitude? He came to serve. He came to serve. And we're supposed to be like him. That's what a Christian is. It's, it's, a, it's a little Christ, as it were. So he came to serve. So what do you think we should be doing? We should be serving. We should be serving. So what do you think when you hear the word ministry? What do you think? Tell me. When you hear the word ministry, what comes to your mind? Ministry. Selflessness. Selflessness. Ministry. What comes to mind when you hear the word ministry? Helping people, like I said. Yes, sir. Serving others. Serving others. Yeah. Ministry. Preaching. Ministry. I'm sorry? Preaching. Preaching. That could be a ministry. I was just on a, uh, we produced a uh, virtual event this week. We did for the state, for our denomination, for licensed ministers uh, that aren't pastoring and lay ministers. And uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, sometimes there's people who want to get into ministry, but they have, they have a different idea about being, minis being ministers. A lot of times they think, the minister, that's going to be the person in charge, and I want to be in charge. So if, if, you are, if you're feeling a call to the ministry, and you think it's because I want to be in charge, <laughs> I, I got news for you. Because guess who is the head of this church? Jesus. Jesus. I was appointed to serve at this local church. Jesus is the head of the church. So the question we need to be thinking about, you can serve, is what is your ministry? What is your ministry? Or, or how can you serve? Well, one of the things you can do is you can serve by loving. Here's a quote for you. <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. You know who said that? Jesus. This is one way you can serve. You can serve by loving people. Be loving. Be loving to people. And that's, that's, the, that's the height or the epitome of servanthood is, is love people. If you love people, then you will serve them. If I'm not serving people, then uh, I might need to check my love for them. Because if you care about people, you serve them. If you don't care about them, it, it doesn't matter. So, so it's all rooted in love. So you can serve by loving. And Jesus said, Love your neighbor as yourself. So you, you may be thinking just like people when they first, when they heard Jesus say that, love your neighbor as yourself. Do you remember the question they asked Jesus? <laughs> Who is my neighbor? Do you know why they asked that question? Because they wanted to narrow it down. Is it just the guy on the right? You know, he doesn't have any kids. I hope it's not the guy on the left because they got 12 kids. <laughs> So I don't want to love the, 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 the crowd. I want to love this guy. You know, they wanted to narrow it down. They said, who's my neighbor? Well, you may remember that Jesus answered that question with the parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember that story. Um, a man that was robbed and beaten and left by the side of the road. His clothes were gone. And the priest walked by. The, the Levite walked by. No one had anything to do with him. But the Samaritan, he did. That man from Samaria, he stopped and he tended to this one. So Jesus used that parable to help us understand who our neighbor is. As a matter of fact, Pastor Brandon Cox says this, Who is your neighbor? It's everyone. It's everyone. That's what Jesus is trying to teach us. When he says, love your neighbor as yourself, and they said, well, you know, can you narrow that down a little bit? Jesus basically said, no, no. It's, it's everybody, including people you don't like, including people you don't think you could associate with. So who's your neighbor? It's everyone, Brandon Cox says. It's the rich 
and the poor and the white and the black and the brown and the refugee and the immigrant. It's the lesbian and the gay man, the conservative and the liberal, the educated and the uneducated. <laughs> Brandon Cox says, the people with tattoos and all those poor people without tattoos. <laughs> the Christian, the Muslim, the atheist, the blue collar worker, the white collar executive, the single person, the married person, the divorced person, the homeless person, it goes on and on and on. Love your neighbor as yourself. You want to be a servant? Love people. It will change the world. It will change the world if people would just love each other. So you can serve. You can serve. I want you to think just a minute. What do you think you can do to serve others and show the love of Christ? Oh, God help your pastor, because here it goes. What do you think you can do? Not me. Not somebody else. But what do you think you can do to serve others and show the love of Christ? Because you may say, well, there's just nothing I can do. I'm busy enough with just working and taking care of my family. Or I'm, 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 you know, I, I don't have, I don't have any talents. I can't do, I can't do anything. You may think that, but you can. You can pray. You can call. You can text. You might be able to email or send a Facebook message. You can be a friend. You can encourage someone. You can love someone. You can just care about someone. So, what do you think you can do to serve others? and show the love of Christ. Here's where it gets fun, because now it's your turn. Because when I was preparing this message, I thought, the Lord just led me to say, I need to ask this question. What do you think you can do to serve others and show the love of Christ? And then see what kind of responses I get. So now it's on you. Anybody? What can you do? You may not be able to start a multi-million dollar nonprofit foundation and, and feed and clothe the homeless and have a homeless shelter. You may not be able to do that. Maybe it won't be that lofty. But is there something you can do? You. Is there something you can do to serve others and show the love of Christ? You can be long-suffering, Mary Jo says. You can give. Yes. Glenda says you can give to those organizations who do all those things. Yes. What can you do to serve others and show the love of Christ? Volunteer? Yes, sir, you can volunteer. I'll tell you what, it, it, it'll bless your heart. You, you think you got problems, and then you volunteer to help others who have the worse off than you do, all of a sudden you start getting some perspective. Anybody else, what can you do? Listen, yes. Brandon, I saw your hand. Amen. It can be that simple. Just, just an act of kindness. Yes, Liz, you say something. Helping with anything that you can yeah. do that someone else is struggling with. Helping somebody, helping with anything somebody else is struggling with that you can do. Just, just help them. See, it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing. A lot of times we think, you know, uh, Christ came to to serve. He came to be a servant. He came to minister, not to be ministered to. And so. Paul says we need to be like him, and you think, wow, it means I need, to, I need to be a minister? I need to be a servant? That's what it's saying? How in the world can I, can I serve? Have, it, a listen. have a listen here, that's right. Uh, Emma, Emma, you can, Emma's going to go home and say, he picked on me today. <laughs> Emma, you know, you know how you can serve? You can serve by loving your family. Yeah, loving your family. That's a way you can you can follow God and serve others just by just by loving them. That's just the way God made it sometimes. Because sometimes we're in a position, right? Sometimes we're in a position where we can go help somebody, right? And sometimes we're in a position where we, we need help. And so sometimes you're able to serve more, sometimes you're not able to serve as much. But there's something you can do. Well, well, what if physically you're just not, you know, somebody needs help, you're just not able physically to help them. Maybe you can find somebody that can help them. Always pray for them. That's exactly right, Brandy. 
That's exactly right. Pray for them. You know, precious sister Margaret Estes, uh, when she was living at home, I would contact her at least once a week, sometimes more than that, and we'd talk for a long time. Well, she'd talk for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but I would intentionally call her with prayer needs that came to the church because I knew she was praying for us. I knew she was praying for us. Um, I, I won't use everybody's name here, so I know it's been recorded, but I talked to one of your mothers today, or this week, talked to one of your mothers, and she said, I won't be, I won't be able to come to church for a while because of the health issues she's going through. But you know what I do when there's a prayer need? I call your mama, you know, somebody that's what I'm talking about. Because I know she's going to pray. She can still be involved in the ministry of this local church. She may not be able to be here today, but she can still pray. I, I had somebody stop by the office the other day. They're not able to be here. It has nothing to do with the coronavirus. It has to do with other health issues they have. But they, they wanted to stop by. A family member stopped by. And James, they want to stop by to say, we want to pay our tithes and our offerings. They want to be a blessing. They want to continue to be a blessing. You know why? Because God had been so good to them. God is so good. And so they wanted to be a servant. So we may think, well, I, you know, I can't, I can't get up front. You know, I can't teach or preach or sing. I remember uh, Glenna, my wife is a great teacher. She's a great teacher. And uh, I remember years ago we were in Greensboro and she was teaching this class and, and everybody said, oh, you're doing such a great job. And Glenna said, I, I just never saw myself doing that. Teaching in Sunday school class and she probably never saw herself being a pastor's wife. But isn't she a great pastor's wife? This would be a good time for you to cheer for her. Isn't she a great pastor's wife? <laughs> she sure is. I remember I had not been here very long, Sister Myrtle, and there was a ladies' retreat. And Bishop Davis told me after the ladies' retreat, he said, we saw your ladies at the ladies' retreat, and so I asked them, how do you like your new pastor? And they said, oh, we like our new pastor, but we love Sister Glenna. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So you know what I've been preaching about for the last few weeks about some hard things Jesus asked us to do. And so a lot of these things are hard. And serving can be hard sometimes. It can. So you may be saying this, it can be hard. So help. Help. I need help. You heard this verse every week during this series, Philippians 4.13. Here's your help, church. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You cannot do it on your own strength. You will fail. But if you say, I, I just don't know what I can do, but Lord, I want to be a servant, so I want to, I want to help. Lord, I want to, I want to help. I want to serve. I, I'm weak, so be my strength. And you know what? The scripture becomes alive in you when in our weakness, his strength is made perfect or made complete. What it takes it on our part is we have to realize that we're weak. Because you try to do it on your own, you know, you wear yourself out, it doesn't get done, you offend people, you, you, just, you just make a mess. But if you let Jesus be your strength, what he'll do is he'll lay somebody on your heart. It may be in the middle of the night. You may wake up and you're thinking about that person. The Lord put that thought in your mind. If you wake up in the middle of the night because you've been thinking about something, I got some advice for you. Just call out their name. That's right, Connie. Call out their name right then. Call out their name. I'll tell you something else that, that's good to do. After that happens the next day, call them and say, you know what? I was praying for you last night. I remember one time that, that uh, happened to me. Someone came to mind and I prayed for him and I was on my way to my office driving down the road and I thought, I'm just going to call him and tell him, hey, friend, I've been praying for you. He said, did you know about this situation? I said, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, friend. He said, I'm facing a decision. It's a life-changing decision for me and my family. I'm not sure which way to go. And man, I need prayer, but I, haven't been, I really didn't feel like I could talk to anybody because you know it's private. And I said, well, you've been talking to God? <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, well, God's been, he, he put your name in my heart. And I prayed for him. He said, man, you just don't know. You just don't know. I challenge you this week to serve. I opened up the service saying, imagine if this place was full. And I realize some are, are not even able to come because of the virus. I understand that. But they'd probably love to hear from you. So if the Lord lays them on your heart and you don't know how to contact them, you know how to contact me. I'll help you. I'll help you. 
Because it, it, makes you, it makes you feel good. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. You can do anything God wants you to do. You can wait on God's perfect timing. You can make peace with difficult people. You can stand out in the crowd. You can win against worry. And you can serve. Can you say amen? amen. We do it all through his strength. Make me a servant. Let that be our prayer today. Humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be, make me a servant. Make me a servant. Make me a servant today. Tony, you played that so well earlier. Would you play it again, friend? <laughs>